Uh, welcome to the Speculations Reading Series, a co-production of Green Haven Books and uh, SF Minnesota, uh, which I think started in the fall of 1995, so I think this is the 19th season. Um, the, the, the Speculations Reading Series, that is. Uh, also, spec, uh, SF Minnesota also hosts a Here, multicultural speculative fiction convention, Diversicon, as the flowers are on. And the speculations readings continue monthly, mostly on Wednesdays. In two weeks, we're going to have Amy Kozinski doing her first reading here. And, uh, and then after that, other people uh, sign our guest book. In this case, tonight we're pleased to have for, what, the several time, probably about six or seven times. Six well, how seven. many, let's see, uh, <laughs> wait, since 2001, I think. Well, okay. So a lot. Oh, wait, wait. These are arcs. You guys should snap these up. These are, are very, very hard to come by. This is a, an advanced reader copy of, of my first novel, Archangel Protocol. This is fairly L used. Lyda Morehouse was also known as Tate Halloway. Oh, oh, and oh. has written lots of stuff, and it's good stuff. And uh, and she's an entertaining reader, so take it away, Lyda. Take it away, Lyda. There's apparently still a signed copy of Tall Okay, Okay, um... What? Okay, sorry. Um, what? <laughs> she says. <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> what are you guys doing here? Is what I was trying to say. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I thought no one would come. So many people are here. I might cry. Okay. Um. So tonight, my my uh, my Wi-Fi. Since I can't actually say the other word, person the person I married, my spouse suggested that I read um, this complete short story God Box from uh, King David and the Spider of Mars, which is an anthology that was recently published by Dido Press. Um, it is a biblical horror anthology, so this will be biblical horror. Which like then, the Bible doesn't have enough horror. Well, that was the horror. idea. <laughs> that was the idea. Actually, this is a very near... Uh, I was in the first collection of these as well. The first one was called... Um, she nailed his faith through his head, to his head, <laughs> through his head, right? And I had a short story in that one as well, which was based on um, Samson, the story of Samson, told from the point of view of his first wife, who is unnamed, the woman of two more. Um, and this is a short story based on, um, well, this one, this, this entire collection only takes place with stories and from judges. So that's very narrow focused. But I managed to find, um, I was just I thumbing through like one does, through oh like one does, God. just going about the house <laughs> on a sunny afternoon. I was like, you know, this whole thing is pretty horrifying. Um, and in it is the story of, some of you may know it as the story of the Golden Hemorrhoids, which is the story in which uh, the bad guys, the, anti the, the people who weren't the Israelites, run off with, and I think they might have been Philistines at this point, I'm not sure, but they run off with um, the Ark of the Covenant, and bad crap happens to them, really bad crap, so bad that they say, you know what, take it back. <laughs> um, and when they say take it back, God says, great, but you first must give me an offering. I want you to, I have plagued you with hemorrhoids, which he did, <laughs> and uh, mice. So I want you to make golden copies of these and then bring them back uh, with the ark. And so they did, and then shortly thereafter, the Israelites lost the covenant. Um, but anyway, so I will read you, this is a, this is a I, I recast this as a science fiction story. So it takes place um, on Ganymede, I believe. And uh, I'll find out in a second when I read this for the first time in a long time. And then, um, what else about it? Yeah, you'll just see, you have to see how it goes. Okay, so, God Box, here we go. When the Enforcer soldiers brought the aliens box into Kayla Okoro's sanctuary, the lights flickered. Though the power fluctuations were common close to the border, no window rattle, rattling boom of a nearby EMP bomb or concussion grenade preceded it. Kayla shivered and clutched the heavy gold cross around her neck. The box was a hideous thing, made of a material that shone darkly metallic, like an inky hematite. Large and dense, it took six soldiers to carry it into the church, like pallbearers. They bore the box on their shoulders. Menacing carvings cover covered the surface. At the ends of the box, sea serpents with rows of spiked teeth and odd arrangements of limbs rose up. Their eyes had been set with a red gem found on Ganymede's rocky outcroppings. Like carnivorous amber, the gem had trapped a creature that glowed with an eerie bioluminescence. The snakes twisted around themselves along the top as if prisoners of a sinister Chinese puzzle box. Why here? she asked, barely keeping the tremor from her voice. The soldiers did not share Kayla's sense of dread. In fact, they were jubilant. When they set the thing down on the altar, they high-fived each other. Loud whoops bounced howly, ho hollowly off the ceiling of the nave. From the cross, Jesus frowned. The alien, <laughs> alien container remained silent. 
Why me, she asked, once the noise dissipated. The commanding officer was a young man, startlingly pale for a soldier in Earth's intergalactic peacekeeping force. Ganymede's radiation had left pockmarks and burn scars on his cheeks and nose. Reverend, your church is on ground that belongs to Earth. It is the next best thing to bringing it to the capital. The soldiers continued to congratulate themselves. Can you fucking believe it? That old fat priestess literally fell off her throne, died on the spot when she heard the box was taken. She broke her own damn neck. The commander waved his hand and shushed his soldiers' cheer. Um, is there some kind of problem, Reverend? He asked, almost apologetic. You were supposed to have received a packet of explaining. Kayla nodded in acquiescence, though it had arrived only minutes before the soldiers, containing some oblique information mentioning an item of political significance. It spoke foremost about Kayla's duty to the system with clear implications. Do this, or we might be forced to remember all those past associations from a misspent youth. For a conclusion, the missive's robotic voice told her that the information was a mere courtesy. The United Church, her bosses back on Earth, had signed off on the transfer. Oh, no, no problem, officer, she said automatically. Kayla's eyes strayed to the dark, gnarled shape on the altar. But, but won't the rovers come after it? I don't know. They seem devastated, but it's important to them, he admitted. We'll be leaving an honor guard for your protection, of course. The two soldiers stepped forward at the commander's gesture. They wore armbands, marking them members of the EDC, the Elite Defense Corps. Kayla was not comforted. She rallied a thin smile of gratitude. Having EDC under her roof complicated things. She would have to be careful. If the two soldiers sensed her inner hostility, they didn't react. Like their brethren, they acted foolishly euphoric, as if they had won the war by stealing this ugly little box. The commander smiled at the soft expression, and the soft expression made his ruined face seem almost handsome. He put a hand on Kayla's shoulder, and she stifled a flinch. Don't worry, he said. We gave those rovers a massive smackdown. We've got them on the run. Rovers on the run. Kayla sincerely doubted his optimism. They believed Ganymede, their ancient homeland. Earth Force scientists couldn't disprove their, couldn't disprove their assertion. Genetically, they had as much in common with the sea as the creatures swimming had in common with the sea creatures swimming in Gan Ganymede's warm underground oceans as the colonists did with the remaining Earth species. The rovers very well might have been cosmic cousins before, according to their legends. They left our solar system many centuries earlier. Unfortunately, the frozen upper crust of Jupiter's cupbearer represented a major source of all the drinkable water in Earth's system. Though water could be found on Europa and in the comet halos, Earth saw the mere idea of alien settlement in their center, in the center of their system, as a personal affront and invasion. There had been war instantly and constantly. The rovers hadn't broke back down either. Their god had told them that Jupiter's watery moon was their ancient homeland. They'd wandered the stars long enough, they'd said. They viewed Earth's colonists as the interlopers. Kayla offered her congratulations on the soldiers' victory. She made appropriate noises about food and drink. The commanding officer declined on behalf of his troops. There were a few wistful glances in her direction as the soldiers transformed their uniforms for the trip back outside, pressure seals hissing and the ozone smell filling the sanctuary. She hugged herself and let, her, let a hand slip into the pocket of her pants to rub the edges of her talisman. The taller of the two EDC officers suited up as well. His dark skin was smooth and unmarked by radiation, but he had seen his share of battles. A thick white line cut through his eyebrow and split his upper eyelid. He introduced himself as Sergeant El Faran. He explained how he would perform a preliminary patrol around the church grounds. Kayla nodded absently. The remaining soldier, his uniform as black as, a bo as the box, stood at the nave. She looked up at Jesus on the cross. His face showed only the slightest suffering, a crease in his brow. Otherwise, his expression was beatific, accepting, and serene. She took comfort from that face now, as she always did. He would not abandon her. He never had, not even in her darkest hours. If she had patience, the soldiers would move their war trophy eventually. Surely, if they were right, and this war had ended, they would take it on parade or send it to the capital. Then she could go back to her real work, God's work. Approaching the soldier, Kayla smiled sweetly as, as sweetly as she could muster. The young man's fingers constantly and absently stroked the leather holster of his peacemaker. Something to drink, officer? Lou, he replied. Corporal Lou, no thank you, ma'am. Reverend, she corrected reflexively. He nodded briskly. Of course, my apologies for reverend. He turned to regard her, and the metallic buttons indicating rank and division glittered off his stiff collar. Kayla recognized the interrogator em em emblem to the left of his corporal insignia. She had trained her soul not to betray her alarm at the sight. An interrogator. Dear God. Please, she said quickly. No offense taken. For a tense moment, he said nothing. Interrogator models could detect the slightest increase of heart rate, the dilation of pupils, and dozens of adrenaline responses. She wished she were a cyborg and controlled her vital signs. 
Finally, she, she, he shifted slightly and asked, would you mind if I take a look around the inside, Reverend? No, 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 of course, go ahead. I, I have work to do in the office, she gestured with a hand that wasn't shaking. And I'll, I'll be in there if you need me. Kayla got to her office in time to throw up into the wastebasket. She heaved until it was empty of everything except, she was empty of everything except the nausea. The last time she saw an interrogator, she was 15. And she had been trying to forget ever since. She pulled a talisman from her pocket, a crude cross, small enough to hide in the palm of her hands. It was fashioned from a broken piece of prison smartcrete and Martian, red, Martian dust red. Onto the flattest surface, she had drawn a stick figure. Jesus' silly, bearded, smiling face never failed to tease out a grin. Her fingers traced the edges of the talisman, wearing down the smooth corners, shining with years of rubbing and the oil of her skin. Kayla set the talisman down carefully on a desk. Her hands were steadier. They couldn't hurt her here. She was a grown woman, nearly twice the age she was then. The talisman had gotten her through those horrible months. It would see her through this trial. Kayla had trouble sleeping. Any time she closed her eyes, memories of the beatings and the rape returned. Isolated images and sensations broke through the years. The acrid smell of his breath, the blood red color of the walls, the creaking of the uniform's nano fabric, the distant sounds of the engineered watchdogs barking in the courtyard. She'd left all that behind when she'd fled Mars with the other refugees. Seminary soothed and buried much of the rest. A damn box had brought it all back. Ganymede was tidally locked to Jupiter. During the five-day sunside cycle, light reflected constantly off the gas giant's atmosphere. The church dimmed to simulate the day-night pattern that human beings, no matter how far removed from Earth, need. At her darkened window, Kayla could see the planet's raging red storm swirling beyond the military's defense bubble dome. It reminded her of the glowing eyes of the box serpents and Martian sand. From her night sand, she, stand, she took the talisman and clutched it to her chest. Its familiar presence slowed her trembling heart. It calmed her to the point where she could form rational, delusion, form rational delusions of normalcy. One simple thought pushed through all the others. If the soldiers stayed, the bandages of time and distance would fade. She would be broken again, perhaps irreparably. She got up. If she convinced the soldiers to move the box, then there was a chance at survival. Sanch the sanctuary seemed deserted. Kayla's fingers gripped the ornate edges of the smart creek doorway and squinted into the cavernous space. At the far end of the church, the alien box box's sea serpent eyes glowed dimly. Corporal Lou? Her voice bounced hollowly off the dark chamber. Would the interrogators still be on duty, or, or would they have sent a replacement? Hello? The only answer was a soft scuttling, the sound of tiny, sharp nails skittering across the stone. Nothing native to Ganymede survived long on the surface. Its oceans swarmed with life, but none of it breathed air, certainly not the highly specific nitrogen-oxygen combination humans imported. Only the rovers claimed and only the rovers claimed ancestral homelands. Kayla groped for the light switch. When she punched the night cycle override code, brightness crawled into the sanctuary. A Twenty-foot stone figures spread out on the floor in the open space before the altar, like a supplicant. She was confused until she saw the empty cross. The statue of Jesus Christ had come off the crucifix and bowed down before the alien's box. She didn't even realize she'd been screaming until the enforcer soldiers rushed in with guns drawn. Corporal Lou gently pulled her up to, to her feet. She clutched at him desperately, suddenly grateful for him in his imposing strength. Seeing the statue, El Faran swore softly in Arabic. Who would do this, he asked no one in particular. Tapping the side of his temple, he issued command. Initiate premier lockdown, APB4. He struggled momentarily to describe the desecration possible vandals. That crucifix was solid marble, Lou said, his arm casually and protectively encircling her, as if accustomed to a hysterical woman sobbing into his nano-armored uniform. Her stomach soured at that thought. She pulled away sharply, the scent of his uniform cloying in the back of her throat. Kayla struggled not to gag. She wiped her eyes. Yes, it was, it was an imported antique from Earth. That would be difficult to replace. I'm sorry for your loss, he said sympathetically, automatically. Do you have any idea who might have had the skill to do this? Skill? He approached the body of Jesus and pointed to it as he spoke. Look at how the so shoulders are rounded, not flat, or hacked as like you'd expect when separating stone in a hurry. Most bizarre to me, he added. Kayla following along like a lost lamb as he climbed the steps of the dais and stood directly under the empty cross. Is that there's no dust. Telemetry detects zero marble particles in the air. Not a single flake or stone chip has been left anywhere. These vandals of yours not only brought a ladder, but a fucking shot back, too. Alfaron gave his subordinate a sharp glance. Pardon my French, ma'am. Sir. Lou said with a different, deferent nod. Kayla shook her head to show she wasn't offended. She stood behind the alien's box, beside the alien's box, looked up the smooth surface of the cross. I couldn't shake the suspicion that God himself had come down off the cross to supplicate before this hideous thing. Beside her, a rattling 
hiss came from the container. Kayla jumped back. Is something alive in there, she asked? No, absolutely not, Alphoron said. He was crouching in Jesus' armpit. We had it scanned and x-rayed in the field. We weren't going to let the rovers go all Trojan horse on us. The sea serpent's glowing red eyes trapped Kayla in its gaze. The metallic head faced in a different direction yesterday. Blinking, she moved her eyes away from the hypnotizing light. You don't think the box had anything to do with this, Lou asked her. No, no, she said quickly, trying to control her and growing on ease. How could it? A crew of 20 in heavy mech suits, two portable cranes, and a high-powered dust mag ma management filter moved to Jesus from the church. The statue was too heavy to be lifted as a single piece, so they took sledgehammers to Christ's body. Kayla couldn't watch. From an exalted position upon his altar, it, on his altar, the box presided over Jesus' eviction. Kayla sensed a smug satisfaction in the toothy grins of the sea serpent's decorations. Of course, the enforcers used the incident as an excuse to bring in more soldiers. A plague of EDC officers with their menacing double sword lapel pins infested the church grounds. An EDC commander, a colonel with sharp beady black eyes, stood over her desk, his eyes clasped behind his back. She knew better than to trust his relaxed pose. The silence between them was fraught with implication. You were a member of the Martian resistance, he said again. His voice was soft and friendly. Kayla was having trouble remembering to breathe. She, had, she reached for the comfort of the talisman in her pocket. She couldn't deny the truth, but she might as well. She couldn't deny the truth. She might as well deny Christ. I was 15. I served my time. I spoke the oath. Yes, you did, he said slowly. I understand that you were difficult to re-educate. Re-educate? Is that what they called it? It had taken two full weeks for them to break her. A record, she discovered later. She'd kept her soul intact by singing hymns and rebel songs to herself in her cell at night until the guards discovered that it was her music was giving comfort to the other prisoners and giving them hope. Without anger or joy, um, they broke her jaw and numbed her vocal cords. She hadn't been able to scream when the interrogators raped her. She had taken the pledge as soon as she could talk. But she had survived without a voice because the talisman Gina, Jesus continued to smile. He loved her. No matter how dirty and disgusting she felt, Jesus would not abandon her. Kayla knew her body had betrayed her the moment the cyborg stepped into the room. Even so, she looked away, past the two guards standing just outside the open door into the sanctuary at the black box on the altar. What does this have to do with the vandalism? Are you still a rebel, he asked? Do you have friends who would work mischief with our war trophy? Never defile the church. Kayla found herself standing, momentarily allowing insult to overcome terror. Her hand clutched her talisman even as the, its edges cut into her palms. Her voice was becoming calm and detached, regardless of any residue feelings I might have towards you enforcers. You should really learn to use the proper term for the peacekeeping force. We might get the wrong impression. Fuck you, she said. The guards straightened their postures and became very attentive. He raised a single eyebrow. Indeed. Kayla waited for more guards to storm in and take her away in handcuffs, but strangely, the EDC colonel dismissed the guards with a nod. He graced Kayla with a quick smile that approached something resembling actual warmth. Well, now that we've dispensed with the games, perhaps I can trust you with information about the rover's coffer. She nodded mutely, too stunned to do more than to relax back into her seat. I understand Sergeant El Farrar told you that we examined the coffer in the field. Fear crept into her spine. Yes, he assured me it was empty. The colonel grimaced. It is, technically. It's not so much what's in the coffer as what it represents. Kayla could not. Could, uh, Kayla could feel the blood draining from her face. And what's that? Well, from what we can decipher, the rovers believe it's a piece of their god is inside the box. The image of Jesus lying down before the altar flashed into her mind. She shook her head. He nodded as though in agreement with her, agreement with her silent thoughts. This is all nonsense. Gods don't exist. The colonel paused for a moment. Oh, except ours. He was not a believer, Kayla could tell by how quickly he added the addendum. The colonel watched her face. He seemed to be looking for something. Finally he said, our God is real. He's stronger than their God. He didn't dare say it, but his eyes held the question mark. Her palms stung from where the talisman edges cut her skin. She knew the answer without hesitation. God has never abandoned me. Well, then all is well. For much of the rest, rest of the afternoon, it was. Kayla watched the box while the soldiers waited and the, the mech crew finished sweeping away the last traces of Jesus. She couldn't quite get rid of the feeling that something sentient inside the box stared back at her. When the radiation alarm sounded, the, goal, the soldiers activated their uniforms quickly, but Kayla and the mech crew were caught unprepared. Kayla rushed to her desk and took the, took the skin patches. She had enough for the congregation, which meant that she could barely accommodate the, the mech crew. When she was certain that everyone was patched, she spoke 
with an authority that had not been in her voice since the box came to desecrate the sanctuary. Everyone without armor, please follow me to the basement shelter. The shelter was tiny. They sat on the floor, hugging knees and elbows to keep from jostling one another, and waited for the klaxon to stop. Kayla's scalp itched, jammed together with so many anxious people, her body rocked back and forth with the memory of the Martian camps. Her sanity frayed with voices, screams, and rebel songs, once comforting but now sinister. She closed her mouth and didn't speak, afraid of what would come out if she allowed words to emerge. It wasn't an attack, the colonel assured her afterwards when they all filed out. HQ reported a random glitch in the bubble. These things happen from time to time. She nodded absently. The bubble had manu mal malfunctioned so, many, so much in the early days that she wore protection suit under her vestments every day. She felt lightheaded and her clothes were soaked with nervous sweat. Kayla gratefully went to the mandatory, if useless, shower without speaking to the colonel further. She, she stripped as the water heated. Kayla caught sight of her reflection in the mirror on the, on the back of the door and gasped. Blisters, stage two ulcerations, covered her back in an S-shape, curving along her spine, like a snake or a sea serpent. It wasn't possible. Her exposure had lasted no more than a few minutes. She continued to inspect herself in disbelief. She noticed an oval spot on her right shoulder blade. It bled, bright crimson, like the eye of the box's guardian. When the soldiers broke down the door, she did not know. It was she that was screaming. In the middle of the night, the sanctuary had become a field hospital. Bodies filled the pews. Every member of the mech crew exhibited symptoms. Two, the two crane operators were already dead. Patients vomited blood into buckets, and advanced necrosis permeated the air. The alien's box remained shrouded in semi-darkness. Kayla had turned the, on the spotlight used during Christmas Eve Mass to illuminate the cross, but Jesus' absence gnawed at her, and she had to turn it off. The red-hot eyes of the box's guardians glared from the cavernous nave and followed her as she wandered among the sick and the dying. The medics that had come with the new battalion of enforcers had assured Kayla that she would live. She had gotten her medicine in time. Under the blisters, the skin would harden to a white scar tissue. However, the eye continued to bleed. They had no answer for why it soaked through every bandage, uh, through a bandage every hour. They gave her blood thickener pills and told her not to worry. She'd come out so much better than the rest. She'd be permanently marked, forever branded with the strange image on her back, but she would survive. She no longer bothered hiding her talisman. She clutched it in her fist, fist and held it close to her heart. Often, she would stop and kiss the smiley face of Jesus the only representation of him left to her in this horrible place. A blinded worker reached out for her as she passed, passed the woman's pew. Kayla flinched. She knew what the woman would say. All of them that crew had asked her the same question. Is it my fault? Because I smashed Jesus. Kayla had, to comfort them, had comforted them at first, reminded them of God's boundless love until she noticed a curious pattern. The stronger the confession, the worse the injury. The man who said, I took a sledgehammer to his face, I, madre, had no part of his skin that wasn't dead black. Open wounds dripped sticky, pus-filled globs that soaked the white sheet and spattered the marble floor yellow-red. He wouldn't last the night. His death would be slow. Had God done this? This was not the kind of loving God she knew, the one who had carefully tended her battered and wounded soul. She was beginning to wonder if she knew God at all. She felt eyes on her, and she looked up to see the rat-faced colonel. He leaned against the wall, his arms crossed in front of his chest. His black gaze bore into her, and she could almost hear his voice asking, our God is stronger than theirs, isn't he? The black, spot, the black box glittered in the darkness. Nausea hit Kayla hard, and she turned and fled. She ran into the garden in the back of the church grounds. The day cycle slowly lightened the courtyard. The green space served as a cemetery. Stones marked with the names of the faithful formed a waterfall in the middle of the space. Kayla's in, Kayla inhaled the smells of the artifacts painstakingly transferred from earth, loamy dirt, thickened mulch, vegetables and edible flowers. Bees buzzed from one trembling blossom to the next. Kayla knelt in the dirt, bowing her head to pray for guidance. She took the talisman out to bring it to her lips. She sought comfort in, of the crude depiction of Jesus, needing that silly, kind smile now more than ever. But it was gone. She, lifted the cross, she flipped the cross over, thinking she must have been holding it wrong. The other side was blank as well. It wasn't possible. Though she'd rubbed it more today than she had in a long time, no way could she have erased Jesus. The image was bonded to the stone on a molecular level. After smudging the talisman out of, smuggling the talisman out of prison, she'd taken the precaution to have the image permanently sealed to the smart creed. She'd paid it dearly for a nanotechnician to reactivate the bots long enough to incorporate her sketch into the rock. She blinked, rubbed tears from her, from her face, and searched the tiny X they've shown, turning it over and over in her hands. I believe her now. Behind her, someone cleared his throat. The rat colonel had come to infest her last quiet refuge. I'm sorry to disturb your prayer, Reverend, he said, but perhaps I bear good news. We're moving the coffer. What? 
Kayla's fingers continued to rub the spot on the makeshift crucifix where the smiley face should have been. Yes, we're going now. He headed for the door. Kayla stood to follow him, her mind struggling to understand what was happening. She shambled after him, feeling empty, but, but I don't understand. Of course we'll remove anyone who lives through the night. Our medical team will make sure they get to the best hospitals. We'll help you bury the dead. But they had returned to the sanctuary. The moans and cries of the suffering filled the church like a baleful choir. On the dais, six grim-faced soldiers heaved the box onto their shoulders. The colonel turned to Kayla. Kayla, you were wrong. Your god is no match for theirs. Elf Ron has convinced me to take the box, box, to a, box to a mosque. Perhaps Allah will think better. <laughs> Words failed Kayla. The muscles in her legs trembled, and she fell, kneeling to the hard marble floor. And there, she saw it. The tiny stick figure was on the floor, face down. Hair obscured the smiley face, the black lines dark on the marble as if it had always been there, deep in the rock's vein, its simple arms outstretched in supplication to the alien box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the, actually how the story goes in, in, the, in Judges. Uh, when they bring, when they bring the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant to various churches, the <clears throat> idols lay down before God. So I thought, wouldn't that be scary if it was in, in some other way? So, there you go. So this is a, we don't have a copy of the book, but this is a, this is a sequel to uh, Precinct 13, which is the last novel that I, I had published from uh, Penguin. Shu, um, they didn't want this, but I don't know why, because they're fools. All right, here we go. Yes, mm, we're not talking about that. Um, all right. Like this, is like this is like that time that I read at uh, at Gay Lexicon late at night. I did a fan fiction reading where we read our slash with um, one of the other guests of honor, Kyle Gold, who read, believe it or not, the most awesome Roadrunner Wiley E. Coyote slash <laughs> ever. <laughs> and there's a really funny video of us online. Actually, it's just him because here's I was like this while he's reading, and then I'm like getting close and like trying to read over his shoulder to see what's gonna happen next. It's pretty awesome. And I blushed all the way through my ridiculously completely sweet, like nobody even hardly touches you, there's one kiss at the end, and I'm like, oh my god! So, anyway, it'll be like that. <clears throat> All right. All right, it's told from the point of view, I'm sure this is going to be I, so that'll be even more awkward. Um, <laughs> point of view of Alex Connor. Here we go. I poked Valentine in the chest. Valentine, we need to talk. The last few nights had been typical of South Dakota in the summer, hot and muggy, so I hadn't worn very much to bed. I was tucked under a thin sheet and nothing more than a sports bra and a pair of Val's cast-off cotton boxers. The open window let in a meager breeze that smelled faintly of du the dusty scent of wheat. Valentine cracked open one eye to look at me. When he was in human form, he was devastatingly handsome. Well, at least to me. I guess other people saw him differently. Where my gaze lingered on regal, strong features, they found sharp lines of his face cold and calculating menace. I'd call his gray eyes smoldering, but they used words like penetrating, intense, predatory. We'd all agree, though, that he was long and lean and had a wonderfully hard, pale skin, color reminiscence of moonlight on alabaster, and deep midnight black hair. At the moment, however, I could sort of understand where other people got their impressions. His black, shoulder-length hair was disheveled by sleep, hiding most of his face, except for a singular, liquid silver eye which stared at me, unblinking, like a lizard's. His voice was gravelly and deep when he snarled, talk. What topic of conversation could possibly worth, be worth disturbing my slumber? You know that thing about sleeping dragons? Anyway, I ignored the menace in his tone. Do you see anything wrong with me? You're awake. After a moment, he added coolly, and talking. <laughs> exactly, I agreed. Do you know why I am awake? I could tell by the way his lips pressed together that he held back a lot of responses that probably began because you live to irritate me or some similar insult. Instead, he finally blinked and let out a long sigh. Perhaps you'd care to enlighten me? Sitting up, I showed him the problem. All over my chest, stuck by sweat, were coins. There was a quarter on my shoulder. A dime had wedged itself into the hollow between my breasts. Pennies covered my arm. I think there was something large, like a Mexican peso or a half dollar, on the inside of my thigh. Peeling a nickel off my neck, I held it out to him. What is this? He snatched the nickel from my hand and shoved it under his pillow. Mine, he said simply. <laughs> he flopped over onto his other side, turning his back to me, like the conversation was over. I sleep better with it. 
Well, I don't, I said, pulling the coins from my body and dropping them one by one on his head. My reign of change didn't even make him flinch. In fact, if anything, the soft sound of the coins clinking together seemed to lull him back to sleep. I nudged him again. Seriously, Val, you have a hoarding problem. <laughs> hmm, problem, you say? He murmured happily, long bone fingers. He picked up a few of the coins from his pillow. He turned them over in his fingers for a moment, doing that thing that magicians do, rolling them some along his hand. Lifting his massive frame, he turned around to face me, making the bed creak. Capturing my eye in that alien gaze of his, he took a quarter from his finger and licked it. <laughs> the way his tongue caressed the metal was sinful. I was utterly mesmerized. <laughs> after, after he finished molesting the money, he stuck it to my arm. He violated another with that long, wicked tongue of his, a penny this time, and pressed it to my stomach. He smiled lazily at me, crooking his finger. He coaxed me down. Reaching up, his, his hand cupped the back of my neck, pulling me close, my ear to his lips. Valentine's deep voice rumbled against my eardrum and sent shockwaves of pleasure to that secret, deep place only he seemed to be able to reach. You're my greatest treasure, Alexander Condor. I li let me lie atop of you. Oh, yes. <laughs> I must have made a noise that indicated affirmation, because he shifted in a way reminiscent of an alligator rolling on top of its prey. <laughs> Quite suddenly, I was trapped under his body weight, and, and his teeth nipped at my ears and throat. His skin was cool where it touched my hot flesh. His breath sent shivers down my spine. I never mind she understood all those romantic songs that talked about desire to be possessed until I met Valentine. Now I wanted him to take me, own me, devour me. As his mouth swept down to envelop mine, my mouth parted hungrily. But Valentine would not be rushed. Maybe it was the cold-blooded dragon thing, but morning sex always began torturously slow. Not that I was complaining. Oh my, can I read this? Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> she reads ahead and goes, oh! <laughs> Oh, wait. Okay. <laughs> as he moved to straddle me, I let myself marvel at the cleverness of his tongue as it slid into my mouth. Oh my god. <laughs> Teasing lips and teeth, sending more shivers along my arching back. No wonder they wanted me to rate this R when I posted this. Okay, anyway, I wrapped my arms around his broad shoulders, knowing that I could dig in with my nails as hard as I wanted. His skin was like stone, almost unbreakable, but I raked my fingers down his side, trying to prod my sleepy dragon into action. He merely broke our kiss to give me a wicked, ah, oh, so that's how it is, smile. Then he moved to nuzzle my neck, neck, nipping ever so slightly at the sensitive skin there. I could feel myself getting, oh, awkward. I can feel myself getting awkward under his torture. I'll just say that instead of what I wrote. His torturously <laughs> slow attention as I squirmed and moaned desperately. When he turned his attention to my breasts, I forgot everything, even the annoying sensation of the coins sticking to our hot, sweaty skin. As I squirmed under his touch, the money clumped softly as a small fortune rained onto the carpet floor. My hands pulled at hair and my nails tempted to scratch, but he took his time, licking and teasing. It was another one of those ridiculous words I always thought stupid, or at the very least, uh, hyper, hyper, hyperbolic. Mm. Hyper, hyper, how is that word? <laughs> to the extreme. But at this moment, with his delicate, sharp bites on my... I felt it. <laughs> I would have given in to wild abandon and screamed if we didn't have a roommate. And even so, I found myself hissing obscenities, demanding to be... Um, well, as you could guess, <laughs> hard now, only much less, articula art, much less articulate. And then I wrote some more of that. <laughs> Thankfully, <laughs> Valentine seemed to understand. And good God. Right. <laughs> a torturously slow but exquisitely sa satisfying hour later, a small fortune clattered to the floor as I left a trail of pennies all the way to the shower. I'll a little more because it gets, it gets a lot less dirty. Um, <laughs> After I showered, dressed, and pulled three euros at dollar thirty-seven out of the drain, I sat down at the breakfast table with our roommate Robert. Actually, Robert owned the house, and Bellington and I were lodgers. Robert was an atypical computer programmer, <laughs> clean-cut, well-socialized, and extremely fabulous dresser. This morning, he was in a crisply ironed white button-down and a tie that managed to match his gentle hazel eyes. Robert and I had forged a friendship through an online game. <laughs> I don't actually say, but it's totally what it is. Um, when things fell apart for me in Chicago, he'd offered me a place to stay until I got back on my feet. He was a really awesome guy, who was apparently as fed up with Valentine's habits as I was starting to be. It's got to stop, Alex. 
Robert said, moving aside the seventh set of salt and pepper shakers on the table to give me a stern look. I think he's got some kind of compulsion. I mean, I love shopping with a man who's got a real eye for beauty and quality, but damn, thank God Hoarders was canceled or we'd be the very next special episode. I know, I said miserably. Robert picked up the silver salt shaker and admired, admired it. Clearly antique, it glittered alluringly in the early morning light. He set it back down gently. Because I don't know how to say this, but I think... I think maybe he didn't exactly pay for all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Valentine's sense of <laughs> some personal pro property was dubious at the best of times. Dragons were thieves. I'd watch Valentine casually steal a car because it was shiny. <laughs> and Robert was saying, This isn't Chicago. There are only 13,000 people in this entire town. It's not going to take long before folks figure out where all their stuff, missing stuff went, Alex. A rape would be especially awkward, since I worked with the police, tangentially, anyway, as the county coroner. Plus, Robert grew up in Pierre. This was his house and his reputation we were ruining. I know, I murmured again, dejectedly, digect, pushing around my soggy cornflakes. I'll try talking to him. Okay, Robert said, in a resigned tone that sounded like he knew just what the outcome of that conversation would be. Because it would be the same as the last several attempts. Pushing it from the table, Robert took his bowl over to the sink. He leaned on the counter and surveyed all the sparkling kitsch that occupied every available counter space in his once tidy, streamlined kitchen. But if this keeps up, Robert's eyes slid from mine to stare at the polished linoleum floor. I think it might be time for you to get a place of your own. So that's all good, too. Okay, so a little bit more? A couple more minutes? Okay. For sure. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, I hopped into the car and made my way to Big Al's, Pierre's best greasy spoon, which I totally made up in case anybody's wondering, to hang out with a guy I accidentally blinded, Devin Fletcher. As I pulled into the parking lot across from the big clock tower downtown, I thought about how I could possibly, st I could probably stop checking in with Devin. After all, he'd gotten better. The last of the cloudiness had disappeared from his eyes three weeks ago. He was back to 2020 vision in under three months. Did I mention Devin was a werewolf? Well, one half were wolf, the other half was vampire. I was pretty sure it was the vampire half that had the super... Shut up, dude, it's awesome. <laughs> pretty sure it was the vampire half that had the super healing powers. As far as I can tell from my daily chats with Devin, being a werewolf was pretty ridiculous, mostly resulting in three-day hiatus from humanity around the full moon, like some uber-masculine ver version of PMS. Despite this ta all this talk for several months, I never got the story of how something like that even happened. Like, was Devin a vampire, got bitten by a werewolf, or a werewolf that changed into a vampire? I didn't know, at least that, uh, what I did know, at least, was that vampires and werewolves were not the mortal em enemies that popular TV shows would have you believe. There was, after all, a ton of top predators that weren't humans. Werewolves apparently really despised Japanese yokai, especially shape shipping boxes. Vampires thought that pixies sucked rocks, and pretty much everyone hated Devon. Except me. <laughs> no, ex in fact, oh, in fact, some days I was starting to think of him as my BFF, unless he started talking, that was. He pointed at me and laughed. A dragon! The dragon is a hoarder! That's fucking hilarious! <laughs> <laughs> Devin sat across me in the cracked and patched vinyl, red vinyl booth. I remember that when I first met him, how disappointed I'd been. He'd look nothing like you were hoping a vampire would. No capes, no bleached blonde hair and wicked British accents, and absolutely no sparkling. He wasn't even the least bit tall, handsome, or dark. I wouldn't call him ugly. He was passively attractive, but he didn't particularly stand out. Devin had ash brown hair, cut short, and a tendency to wear ready college t-shirts and in the summer cut off jeans. His one salient feature was the smirk that everyone wanted to wipe off his face permanently. Yeah, I'm already in my copies. Hilarious and soon to be homeless. Poor baby, he said completely unsympathetically. I sighed, well, at least I have a salary now. I should be able to find some place in town, right? Devin shrugged, picking up a nearly transparent strip, strip of bacon from our mutual plate and munched on it. I wouldn't know. I live in Spencer's shed. I nearly choked. What, he makes you live in this shed? Well, it's better than a dog house, he mused. He likes to keep me close by, you know, in case he needs something. To be fair, Devin's crappy outlook on life might have something to do with the fact that he was a slave. No one ever said that word, of course, but our boss, the head of Precinct 13, a fairy prince named Spencer Jones, had trapped Devin in a blood, in blood glamour. The problem was fairy food. If you ate it, you became enthralled, in the classic to become a thrall sense of that word. For Devin, blood is food. And when he tried to kill Spencer by sucking his blood, he discovers the tables turned and himself <coughs> enslaved. Forever. Maybe I shouldn't care. After all, Devon had been trying to murder Spencer and had <coughs> gotten his comeuppance. But I thought maybe part of my squick was that Spencer's laissez-faire attitude towards <coughs> aiming Devon. Spencer seemed to never hesitate to use Devon's superpowers when he needed them. It was kind of creepy to watch him jerk at Devon's leash. 
a shed. I repeated horrified all over again. Have you talked to Valentine about that spell <coughs> that will free you? Devin, Devin raised an eyebrow. You think I should trust a dragon over a fairy? He's not going to eat you, I joked. You sure? <laughs> I hated when people asked me that, because frankly, I wasn't. <laughs> I covered my discomfort by trying to pick out the least greasy piece of bacon. Devin must have spotted my sensitive subject, because he continued. When a dragon tells me he wants to end my misery, I tend to think he's talking about the final solution, don't you? <laughs> you shut up. So, that's, we'll leave it there. I could go on because what's cool, what happens next is the werewolf gang shows up, but um, their motorcycle gang coming into town, the lone wolves. <laughs> I, I was seriously thinking they should have like timber wolf jackets. I don't know. <laughs> Wait, this place where you're posting it can really be kudos. Yes, you can. Yeah. It's just like, really it's like, a, oh yeah, I should tell Wait, you, if you want to. This wanna, is great, write more. Yeah, if you liked this, um, I'm posting it once a week. I'm going to be writing it on the fly, and I'm posting it once a week in a place called Wattpad, like W-A-T-T-P-A-D, yeah? Um, and it's free, so you can come and check it out and um, read my stuff, leave me kudos, tell me how much you like it. And since I'm writing it on the fly, if you decide you really want, you know, I don't know, Devin and the, the dragon to sleep together, you can, like, <laughs> suggest that, and maybe it would accidentally happen. I mean, I don't know, so. Is it under your... Is it under it's under Tate Heller. Tate Heller. I've decided it might be fun. I mean, uh, one of the things I've been struggling with is that it's so much more fun to write fan fiction because, you know, you post something and then people send you kudos and they send you comments and it feels really like you're not doing it alone in a void, you know? And so um, this is sort of what a Wattpad, so if anybody else is writers and want to give this a try, I don't, you don't have to be a professional writer to post stuff. You can just post whatever you're writing and some people never finish what they're writing, but, you know. Is it proper to ask if you're an AO3? It is totally proper to ask if I'm an AO3. You can find me there under my secret name, though. <laughs> okay. It's my secret name is Junko, J-U-N-K-O. Okay. And I only write bleach fanfic, so See, good I, luck to you. I thought so. um, there you the other secret identity. My secret identity. The other thing I write, though, see, because I'm like, maybe there's somebody here who might be watching this. Have you guys watched Free? <gasps> the gay swimming anime? You have to watch the gay swimming anime. I'm going to tell you why. Okay. Um, okay. Actually, first of all, all the kids all right, were watching <laughs> Attack on Titan, and it was coming out um, live in Japan. I was watching it on Crunchyroll, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm watching the simulcast of Attack on Titan, and it was so horrible, okay? People get eaten by giant titans. I mean, eaten. Ah. And it's horrifying, and like you're getting invested, and you're like, oh, I love this guy. What's his name? Marco. Oh, Marco's dead. <laughs> um, and, then, and, then, and then the guy, the, oh, Marco. I'm still upset about Marco. But anyway, so Marco's dead, right? And then you go over to Free, and Free is about these guys who are in a swimming club, and they, they're not officially gay, but <laughs> and they, they are so happy, and like nothing happens to them. There's the worst episode is called something like "Breath Stops," and there's a brief moment where you think somebody might be in trouble, but they're not. And it's, so like, and it's like you know, you can go back to your anime where people get eaten, and it's, everything's horrible, and war is horrible, and people die, and everybody don't even learn anybody but the main character's name. And at once, when I was watching Attack on Titan, I'm like, it looks like the main character's dead. I seriously had to go to Wikipedia and be like, is that it? Is he dead now? Is, like, the shonen hero going to be dead? And, like, the whole point is the shonen, shonen hero going to be like, well, he gave a rousing speech once, so we should try to keep living. I thought that maybe was it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went back over to Free, and I'm like, oh, they're shopping now. <laughs> oh, I love them. <laughs> oh, my God, I love them. So I wrote some fan fiction about them because, and then I crossed Bleach with it because oh, there's God. one point where, Wait. So there's one point where, where the hero loses all his powers, right? And he's hiring himself out. And this is canon. He's hiring himself out to sports teams. And I thought, well, he can hire himself out to the gay swimming group. And he goes and he has a really completely boring adventure with them. And it's fantastic because it's just what he needs because his whole life has been like slashing people. And, you know, so he kind of has like this like little relaxation from post-traumatic stress, well, uh, who cares? Just go to AO3 and find junk, though, and if you want to read any of it, it's all smutty. I wrote, like, 5,100 million words of these two guys getting it on over and over in a very just different ways. Just follow the tags, if whatever your kink is, I'm sure I wrote it. They always try not to die. <laughs> She and I are going to write some smut together. That's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> See how I didn't tell them? I, I, I wrote a Star Wars fan fiction about 
Star Trek Doctor Who crossover <gasps> called Amok Time Lord. Oh, that's fantastic! <laughs> you know, someone wrote a Bleach Star Trek crossover and they never updated it and I'm so pissed off because oh, I was I like, that. what? Yeah. I know, I started reading them like, this is totally, I can't even, yeah, I want more. And they never, they never finished. So does it deal with the breeding practices in Gallifrey? Um, well, it, it's, um, it, it involves, uh, the Doctor um, ending up in the Star Trek universe during the events of the episode of Mock Time and a mind meld with Spock oh, has effects on him. And, yeah. Oh, that sounds very bad. That could be interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's Junko, what's the site? Uh, AO3, which stands for Archive of Our Own dot ORG. You really gonna go there? Do you know how I will not be able to look you in the eye ever again? You're gonna walk up to me and be like, you haven't seen what I wrote. I... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. I haven't. My wife says, you're not going to publish that. <laughs> you might be associated with me. Yeah. No, seriously, when I when I read my first piece in this, which when you go and read the first one, you're going to be like, she had trouble reading this. What was wrong with her? But I was seriously reading it, and my hands were shaking, and I was like almost crying, because I'm like, it's so... I, mean, I could barely read this. I mean, and, it, and there was... Oh. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you.